All right. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to um, share my screen here. Just a second. All right. Um, so welcome to the Adult Programming Ideas for Your Library webinar. Um, of course, we couldn't fit all of the adult programming ideas that are out there into a single hour long webinar. Um, so today, Katrina and I will be focusing on some arts based programs. Um, but first, we're going to just introduce ourselves really quickly here. Hi, I'm Katrina Harkness. I'm the adult learning consultant. And I'm Amy Tipler. I'm the continuing education coordinator um, here in the Bureau of Library Development. And today, like we said, adult programming ideas. So Katrina and I are gonna go over um, just a couple of ideas that we've found that we thought were really great. And then we're gonna also turn things over to Ellen India. She's the adult services coordinator from Sarasota Public Libraries and Historical Resources. And she'll be sharing some unique adult programming ideas as well that they do um, at their library system. So today, um, like I said, we'll be going over the arts. And one thing that we found that was really cool, we thought it was a great idea, and I know there have been a couple of libraries in Florida that have done something similar to this, um, is a poet in residence. It's actually something that the um, a library in Wisconsin has done. Um, I'm putting the link in the chat to their news article about it. Um, but they found a published poet in their community and they offered her a, a residence um, for the month of April, which is poetry month. Um, but this could be a year round program or done in honor of another month or if there's a local poet that you know writes about nature, maybe it's for Earth Day. Um, so there's lots of different options out there. Um, so, you know, you could choose a, an English teacher or someone from a local writing organization or have a new adult poet that's out there um, that's just been published as well. Um, and something that they did in Wisconsin, which was really cool, was they had the poet in residence actually create workshops and events for all ages um, based on different level skill levels, um, read the poet's works in a you know poetry class or a poetry slam. Um, so really highlight their work, but also have the poet help others um, to develop their own work as well. And so um, there are some other ideas um, out there. Um, so poetry classes and slams, you know, how to become published um, and poetry for readers of all abilities, you know, really focusing on different age groups, but also ability levels. Some people, you know, pen to paper isn't the best for them. Um, I know Leon County a couple years ago, they had um, people submit poetry and then they were created into short videos with, you know, relevant um, graphics attached to it and they post them on their Instagram. Having poets submitting them in different mediums and different um, forms might really help open up to have better inclusion um, with the program. And um, there also could be some art inspired um, poetry contests or even a poetry walk. There are story walks. Why not? Put poet in residence write a poem about the library or the community or town that you're in. Um, sometimes story walks are at local parks. The poet could write a poem about the local park or even the history of the area. Um, so it kind of gives that double element of getting people out and about, but also highlighting poetry and the poet in residence work as well. And you get a unique poem out of it. Um, you could also have a publication in house. There are creative writing clubs, you know, assign an editor in chief, have people submit poems, um, publish like a little mini booklet that you have for checkout in your local library. Um, so there's a lot of ways to engage. Poetry is such a unique way to engage with the community. Um, it can really speak to patrons of all ages, reading levels, and backgrounds. Um, and to move on, we're just going to really quick. Um, because here at Bureau Library Development, we haven't talked about adult programming in a while. So we just wanted to talk about some inclusivity and, you know, it's just a kind of a refresher. We know everyone is really good at this. Um, but of course, you know, getting back to in-person after the last couple of years, you know, spacing between chairs and walkways. Um, having a variety of supplies on hand if you're doing an art class or, you know, something with crafting, having adaptive tools and grips, larger paint brushes or needles or whatever it is that you're using, having some options for people that might need them, as well as pre-made examples and instruction sheets. You know, some people are better at listening and following along. Some people need it written on a piece of paper. And some people just like to look at examples and kind of go off of what they think is the best route to take. 
um, for the order of how it should be created. And also having an alternative craft on hand. Sometimes I know when I worked in a library, we would have arts and crafts and some people would be like, I just made that last week or, oh, I don't know that I wanna create that. And then having that alternative on hand, just something quick and easy, you know, not that's gonna take a lot of staff time or anything, or that could be used from a prior month um, and having that as an alternative option um, sometimes will really help patrons um, who feel a little stuck. Um, and of course, with virtual events, live captioning or captioning for recordings, easy to read slides, making sure presenters are talking at a good volume. And I know a lot of um, libraries do trivia, having interactive quizzes, but also alternative options, having the, you know, slides on the screen that have the same questions and patrons can message their answers to the hosts or having, you know, a written alternative as well, just to kind of have that universal design for people who might not be so tech savvy, but still want to go or, you know, have that interactive option as well. And we will be sharing some resources and websites for checking contrast on websites and materials um, to make sure that they're easy to read, as well as some other resources for inclusion with programming. Um, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Katrina. Hi, this is Katrina. So we wanted to share a specific programming example, and this is from the ALA's Programming Librarian website. And Amy, I'll share the link with you in chat. Um, so that you can read it. I know that you can't read the screenshot there. But in 2020, ALA awarded its first Libraries Transform Communities engagement grant to the Milwaukee Public Library for their Deaf Story Slam. The Story Slam is a free community event. Deaf participants share their personal stories and experiences with a broader community. Workshops are led by deaf storytelling coaches and stories are told in an American Sign Language and interpreted into English and Spanish. Being intentional about inclusion um, from the very start of the program was key to its success and uh, as was having their community partners. Um, so this article is on, on the website, but if you go to the page, if you follow the link at the bottom, they also have a specific program model module on uh, the, the where they've laid out how they budgeted, how they marketed, all the, all the component pieces of, of putting together that program. The next uh, thing I want to talk about are state library resources for library staff. So it is um, part of our collection policy to collect and provide materials for professional development. Recently, we had a request for more information on programming for adults with developmental disabilities. So we acquired this um, book for our collection. This is an actual uh, photograph I took of the book. This is, you know, not a not a um, stock image. This is this is the real book that you will receive if you borrow this through interlibrary loan. And Amy will put that in chat. And I wanted to kind of remind people that if you are looking for expert speakers, particular topics that you want to hear about, discussion groups that you have. Um, we're here to help facilitate that. Please let us know in the chat or in the follow-up survey that you're going to get or um, anytime send us an email and just, just let us know what you'd like to see. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is our new Express Reads collection. Um, we've recently added 62 titles to the Express Reads collection. These are books for literacy and ESOL learners that are short, engaging, um, many mysteries, some romances, um, and they're also um, good general interest books. So um, right now I'm looking for some folks that, from libraries that want to pilot some ideas and how to use these programs. Some ideas I've gathered from the field already are um, for literacy programs. Sometimes students and tutors like to read the same book, and this is an opportunity for them to do that um, and for individual reading as well. Instant book clubs, if you had 10 copies of the same book, you could um, they're so short, you can um, sit down and let everybody read for half an hour and get started and come back together and discuss the book. I, um, I found that a lot of folks in, um, have been struggling with focus, um, lack of time to read. I was working with um, 
a friend's grandmother who had had some health issues and had pretty much given up on reading, not because she can't read or she can't see, but just she was having a hard time with the focus. And it was really uh, painful for her to admit it was being a reader is a big part of her, her self image. And I brought some books for for her to test and she read the first three in the first week and asked me for some more. And then she read those and asked me for some more. And then while she was returning to those her uh, daughter in law had an exchange student 19 year old um, who's here uh, because she wants to practice her English and she before the books could be returned grabbed them and said can I can I read a few of those. Um, so I think i um, really excited to be to be offering this and so some of the things um, like to see that we could use them for literacy programs just book displays book clubs so if if you'd um, like to give them a test drive, as I like to say. Um, we our collection is kind of an airbnb for books we would love to have our books come in vacation in your library so um go ahead and check those out amy's put a link into our catalog into the chat um, or you can send me an email later if you're interested in learning more the next thing i want to talk about is this is not our resource but this is the uh, florida braille and talking book library the Florida uh, Bureau of Braille and Talking Book Library is the largest library of its kind in the US with a collection of more than 2.4 million items in Braille and audio format. A big shout out right now to Pinellas Talking Book Library. They're this year's winner of the National Library Service Subregional Library of the Year Award. Congratulations. And I think we've got some folks from Pinellas here today. Um, and also I'd like to invite uh, you to join us for an upcoming discussion Monday, June 20th at three o'clock about the Florida Braille and Talking Book Library with Maureen Dorosinski, who's going to be here with us um, and talk about how your patrons can uh, access and use these resources, how to be certified, um, how your patrons can be certified to be eligible for these, that librarians are qualified to certify um patrons so how you would go about getting one of your patrons certified and these are for uh, services are available for blind patrons and also those who are print disabled who who um, are not blind but have trouble holding or um, reading a print book and now i'd like to turn things back over to amy Yeah, so um, here are just some resources. Um, like we've mentioned before, the Braille and Talking Book Library and the professional development books, we've put the links in the chat. Um, I know it was mentioned before that for the Deaf Story Slam, there's a checklist of sorts um, to get started if you wanted to build a program like that on that article. Um, so what we did for the Poet in Residence one, because there isn't one for that, is we kind of built our own checklist for that one. So you'll be getting in an email later an adult programming checklist for the things that we've talked about and as well as some links and some other resources as well um, but now we'd like to turn it over to ellen india and she's just going to be sharing some of their wonderful really exciting programs that they do there thanks amy good morning everybody happy to see everyone kind of sort of and get together and chat a little bit about adult programming in libraries uh, let me go down here and share my screen and get started here. Can everybody see that okay? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, good. All right. So the title of my presentation is New and Enhanced Adult Programming because of course, in the last few years, we've had to kind of um, we've had to re-envision all of our services and programs at the library. And so um, we had to kind of take a hard look at everything and see what we wanted to change and how we wanted to change it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about us. Um, we are Sarasota County Library and Historical Resources. So we do have the History Center, all of the um, historical resources and archives uh, under our same umbrella. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, partner programs. So there are about 419,000 residents in Sarasota County. Um, we do have 10 library locations, and then we also have the History Center, as I mentioned, um, with approximately 189 employees 
total. And that's me, Ellen India. I'm the adult services coordinator. Um, I'm at an outreach event there. And so I help work with um, library staff that primarily work with patrons um, 18 and up. So I thought before we talk about programming, I'd like to talk about programming funding support because I realized that everybody has a different setup. And that's really important when you think about um, you know, your programming and when you, you plan your programming. Of course, all of our libraries have a friends group, but you know, the friends group is not, the programming funding, I should say, is not equitable throughout the library system. Um, we do have a couple of community foundations here in Sarasota, which is great. And we do, we're very, very fortunate to have our own library foundation. So we try really hard to uh, use supplemental funds from the community foundations um, whenever we can for the funding, because especially if we're doing system-wide programming, we want it to be equitable throughout the system. So of course, in the last couple of years, the first thing we thought was really important is to try to connect with people but also provide a, a, a place for them to de-stress. And so we had a variety of different ways that we did that. We had some live sessions with chair yoga, adult coloring lounge, um, yak and yarn, which I think is just, it's funny, um, it's a funny name, but you know, it, sometimes it's not about the numbers, it's just about people coming together and um, feeling like they're in a safe space and building community. Um, we also had some live poetry um, sessions through Zoom, um, but some of these in-person ones um, were really fun. Um, this is a crystal bowl sound bath meditation. Who doesn't want to do that? That sounds nice at almost any point in time. Um, we had some on-demand programs, of course, as well. Um, you know, none of us really here in Florida, we're prepared for hurricanes for the most part, but we certainly didn't know that COVID was on the horizon and we hadn't really prepared for it. But some of the things that COVID kind of forced us into as far as programming is looking at how we can reach more people virtually, which is great, which is something we really needed to do. And now we always have some on-demand programming. So we were able to provide some on-demand um, poetry readings, yoga and stretching, some basic um, cooking classes, essential pantry, and a variety of others. They were, they were very popular and we're gonna continue to do that. So Sarasota County is an arts-driven older community in general. And so anything involving live music is always going to be very popular. So we have done some in the last couple of years, Blues on the Lawn, where we bring in some different blues groups and people can space themselves out here on the lawn. Um, Cineselby is a very interesting program that we have traditionally done. It took a while to kind of uh, gain some traction, but basically we were just pulling foreign films from our collection um to show as part of a foreign film series and actually after a while you know after maybe six months eight months something like that word kind of spread and now everybody really um wants to come to the next Cine Selby and see what other foreign film they they might be interested in watching and then it it brings a little bit more attention also to our collection as well um we did do some zoom adult trivia and dungeons and dragons um, art and Common Places, again, we are very much an arts-driven community, so Arts and Common Places allowed us to bring in artists to talk about their work in the libraries, and they also provided the same lecture uh, through Zoom. We are fortunate to have some really um, very talented librarians who um, offer sketch classes, and they say they have a lot of people show up. I think that's probably very therapeutic, too. Um, and so the Let's Get Crafty and Let's Sketch programs are very popular. Also, I think probably maybe, maybe maybe most of you out there are familiar with the NASA Space Ambassadors here in Florida. We do have that connection with having a, um, a launch facility nearby. Those programs are always very, very well attended. People love to hear about uh, the different space programs that are going on. One of the fun ones that I like is this group called the Downton Abbey Support Group. 
And this is an older group of women who were, they were library users, very regular library users, but they didn't really know the technology. Um, for example, even though they'd been coming to the library very regularly for years, they'd never really used the online catalog. They were still like hard catalog people at heart. And so um, they kind of approached staff and said, hey, we're just people who want to get together in one of your meeting rooms and talk about Downton Abbey. Can we do that? And the librarian kind of said, you know, this might make a great opportunity to uh, have some sort of a library program where we can really have a chance to showcase what the library resources are. And so that's what that has become. They were a Downton Abbey support group because Downton Abbey ended, but I'm thinking that when Bridgerton came around, they probably are still meeting, I know. So they probably were starting to uh, watch Bridgerton as well. But we were able to um, introduce different uh, resources into their meetings to let them know how they could learn more things about Downton Abbey and about High Clare Castle and what databases they could use. And we helped them learn about resources at the library um, that they were not familiar with, um, all through their love of Downton Abbey, which is what kept them going. So that's just kind of a fun group. Um, also, very important ongoing work that we do with our literacy organizations. They're some of our strongest partners and libraries, of course. So having French conversations at the library or ESOL classes um, are always um, well attended. On demand, again, we had a variety of different things that we offered, simple and fun adult crafts, um, different creation station projects where people could see how different um, items worked. Looking forward to having those in-person creation station programs coming up again soon. Um, we also partner with the Sarasota County uh, Arts and Cultural Alliance, and we have a contract with them where we bring in different artists to provide a series of workshops where people can actually participate in creating something along with the artist um, as their tutor and very popular program. Um, and um, we have a whole variety of different artists that provide a lot of different kinds of programs and the staff at each location kind of picks the one that they want um, for the different age group that they think is best suited for that. So we provide artists and the library programs for all ages. We have youth programs, teen and adult. So I am always looking for some way to make our community read um, program, which is called um, One Book, One Community. I oversee that program and of course, Hearing the author is great. Book discussions, you know, everybody does book discussions. So it's like, what else can we do to kind of promote our community read program? So a couple of years ago, we decided to make a, a escape room kit with the theme of that year, which was the Radium Girls. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with these uh, breakout EDU escape kits, but basically you have, um, five different locks, five or six different locks, and you have all different kinds of clues. We give them uh, information from the book um, and other information as well. Some of it is just kind of a fake information to throw them off. If you have read the book, it's great. You'll probably get the clues faster, but you don't have to have necessarily read the book before. Um, you can kind of learn the story along the way and figure it out. For example, um, for the book Radium Girls, we had the um, the chart, and now I can't remember the name of the chart with all the, the elements and everything. And if you looked at that and saw the number four radium and then went to one of the, the locks, it would work and it would open up, you know, one of the locks. So we have like three letters or numbers and then four numbers and three letters. And so we have a variety of different ways that you can use the various clues to get into the locks and eventually um, solve the whole kit. And these are just so much fun and they're very, very popular. And we're going to do it every year now for our one book because it brings people together. It's intergenerational. So you have a whole family here playing the game together. You have some seniors who came in who did not know each other 
but now they all do because they they solve the puzzle together and um, it's just a lot of great fun. It brings people together and they also learn about the one book program and specifically about the book that we've chosen. So um, it's a lot of fun. Um, last year, or actually this year, our book was The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind and this is the author, William Kamkwamba. And we actually got to show him the kit that we had created for his book. So here he is looking at his life story you know, looking at these various clues, trying to solve the case so he can uh, unlock the lock and get into the box. And he just was, he just thought that was so much fun. He thought that was just great. And he said, can I take a picture of this? And so we said, yeah. So it, it was just great fun. Again, these are very, it's just a way to turn uh, a literary um, event into, uh, you know, you kind of gamify it. It has, adds a different twist to it. So it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Adulting 101 is also something that's important to us. Um, we're, we're always talking about ways that we can kind of reach the emerging adult population. It's kind of tricky, as you probably know. Um, this particular series, Adulting 101, was, um, was designed by a teen librarian specifically for ages 13 to 22. And he brought in subject matter experts on all of these various uh, categories here. It was a series of eight programs on basically independent living. And he had a great turnout. And most attendees made all eight sessions, which was really incredible when you're looking at a young adult population. So they had registering to vote. They had finding a job, all about college grants and admissions. Um, we had budgeting, financial literacy. Um, we've also put on job and career fairs um, at the library. The job and career fairs is a little bit uh, of work, but if you can partner with the schools to bring the kids over and you partner with other community organizations, it kind of helps build your community uh, network for partners and programs. And so that's great too. Um, the New Adult Summit is interesting. Probably most libraries have the teen advisory board where you bring the teens in and you say, you know, you want them to help you create the, the programs because, of course, it doesn't make sense for um, somebody who's not a teen to sit around and try to figure out what teens might want. You want to you want to let them figure it out. So same idea with the new adult uh, summit. Basically, um, what they said is, hey, if you're between the ages of you know, 18 and 25, um, come on in, we'll play some trivia, we'll, and then we'll ask your input for improving our area's offering for adults like you. And so it's really great, again, to get the community, the patrons input on what, what programs they wanna see. So partnerships are very important um, source for everything we do. We were uh, really lucky in that for the Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, we partnered with our local extension services and sustainability, and it was just a great partnership. Um, this particular book had so many topics in it that really related to the different programs that extension services and sustainability offered. So it was just a perfect partnership. So sometimes uh, in the past, what we have done is we've worked with them on creating um, items that are actually in our library system now. This is the do-it-yourself home energy audit kit, which is great. You can check out this backpack. It has all this different equipment and you can do your home energy audit kit at home and see mm -hmm. how you're doing with your electricity, how you're doing with your water. And of course, as we know, the, the prices are going up with everything now. This is an important tool for people to assess how they maybe can do better at home. So we worked out um, programming with this kit. And so we had home energy savings workshops where we showed people how to use the kit and then they could check it out from the library. We also partnered with them on living sustainably, making savvy decisions at the grocery store, solar energy for homeowners, edible gardens, composting, and, and a lot more. And so um, they've really been great partners for us. And I encourage everybody to try them if you haven't yet, because they usually have a lot of great programs that you can you can have right there. You know, I think what we were mm -hmm. thinking about is that typically when the libraries are open, we have them in our libraries providing, for example, um, 
a plant clinic where you can bring in a plant and say, you know, this is what's happening to it. And they can give you ideas as to how to treat if it's a particular disease or a particular pest that you're worried about. And so we wanted to try to recreate what was happening in the libraries um, online as well. And so we wanted to provide partner programs with extension services whenever we could. Ah, so we did have, as many of you probably did also, um, some takeaway kits because in the early days when we were closed or people just weren't comfortable coming into the library, even after we reopened, we wanted to be able to give people um, a way to interact with us. We wanted to maintain that connection with people that we had built up over the years. And so it was a way for us to kind of keep that connection going and, and keep providing resources for them. Um, me and my counterpart, who's the Youth and Family Services Coordinator, provided and put together these kits for system-wide distribution. So we had board and busters for all ages. We had take-home crafts for all ages. Um, we had DIY story time mm -hmm. for the kids. It was a variety of different like brain teasers and games that we put together for the board and busters. And we had a whole bunch of different crafts that we did. So we continued to provide system-wide materials and crafts and uh, take-home bags throughout 2020 and 2021. Now we're kind of transitioning into custom location bags. We're not providing it system-wide, but we know some libraries are still, um, their patrons really enjoyed it, you know. So it might be something that is a standalone, like a movie and popcorn that goes in the family movie night uh, custom bag, or it might be a supplement to something that they're doing. So if they're doing a virtual program online, you might come into the library to pick up your supplies, and then you follow along at home um, when they do the virtual program and the craft, and you can follow along and see how it's done that way. So again, I think this is something that we hadn't really ever done before, but now we think this is great. People love it. We will continue to offer it in a variety of different ways. So our county centennial was last year and um, it was it was very fun. It was, it was the perfect time for us to showcase historical uh, resources. And um, we were able to offer these, I put together these trolley rides. There were actually already some trolley rides downtown and they were looking at historical things. So we kind of branded it as, um, you know, a centennial trolley tour. And so the trolley would pick you up at the library and you can see there's everybody um, there and we would go to a variety of different places. We did three trolley tours in three different neighborhoods in Sarasota County. And they were all very, very popular. And we had goodie bags for everybody too. And in this case, we had um, this lady who was a reenactor. So she was a theatrical person and she was in character as somebody who was one of our early founders of Sarasota County. So it gave people a chance to participate in a library program without coming into the library and they could distance themselves. Um, we made sure we didn't have the registration too high so they could distance themselves and space out accordingly on the trolleys. We had other people in the history center who were archival specialists or archeologists who provided a, a lot of great programming online about preserving your family's mm -hmm. history, Sarasota suffragettes, um, the architects and architecture of Sarasota County, uh, the spring training in Sarasota, and our um, Sarasota's remarkable impact on the game of golf, which in case you didn't know, one of the first people to come and settle in Sarasota was Scottish and he brought the game of golf to Sarasota County. And I think it was the first time it was introduced um, to Florida. And um, so now of course golf is known all over the place. Now, all of these slides did not come out, but these are all of our on-demand slides. And um, one thing that we did um, say that we were going to do and we kept to it is we offered 100 programs in 100 days. Um, and so when on-demand, we had a whole channel of uh, centennial programming available that people could watch. Sometimes they were standalone programming. Sometimes it was programming that we did that we just recorded. 
Um, but it was a whole variety. And I think there's 68 different programs there. There's walking tours of Sarasota County. But we did also create these oral histories called um, 100 Years, 100 Stories. And we're still in the process of uh, final editing and captioning for that because we did want to make sure that everything that we do online virtually as a program, we offer captioning for people. And so um, the 100 Years, 100 Stories is all these different people and how they came to Sarasota County and how it's changed through the years. So um, very, very interesting. And we're glad we were able to do that because some of the programs that we created, a lot of these will now be part of our archives here in our you know, own history center as well. Our community read for the centennial was aligned with um, that theme. So we picked Suncoast Empire, which was about an early founder of ours, Bertha Palmer. And, um, you know, you have the author come and speak and you usually get a pretty good amount of people showing up. That's great. But the other twist that we did is, we again, we had somebody in the theater. This is actually the same actress. And now she's in character as Bertha Palmer. And so it was great because you had the author, Frank uh, Castle, Dr. Castle, you know, talking about Bertha's life and then you'd have Bertha and you can kind of see her over here kind of saying, well, Frank, it wasn't really exactly like that. Let me tell you the real story, you know. So when you add a theatrical component to any program like this, um, you know, it's just a little bit more interesting. And in our community, especially, as I said, we're an arts driven older community, um, you really get a lot more people who are interested in coming to hear an author or learn about a book when you have a theatrical twist. The other thing that we did for this particular program with the author and with uh, Bertha here herself is another interesting thing about Bertha Palmer is she's kind of responsible for the invention of the brownie. And so um, I made Bertha Palmer brownies and we had Bertha Palmer tea not Arnold, but Bertha Palmer tea. So again, of course, whenever you add food, people want to come as well. So another little twist. Um, along the same lines, every year for the one book, I talk to these folks here. They're the Oslo play readers, and they are retired actors, and they do theatrical readings from the book. Again, always well attended, and it brings attention to a program that we're doing at the library and to the book itself. And um, it's just it's just always well attended and fun. And I think probably my time is up, so I will say thank you, and we will see if there's any questions. Yes, thank you so much, Ellen. I always get really excited when you talk about some of these programs, especially the the actor and the new adult summit those are just such great programs and such a great twist to like thank regular you. programs yeah thank you i i have one question how did you find the the authors um for your one book one community particularly um the boy who harnessed the wind yes we have a one book selection committee and so we look at a variety of different books. So we start with 20 something books in the beginning and then we just keep filtering it down. But one of the parameters in our search is that the author has to be alive, engaging and affordable. And um, so those are all real important things we've learned from past uh, one book selections that, that didn't work out because we couldn't get the author for whatever reason. And so, uh, for William Kumkwamba, um, we knew um, that we really wanted to have an uplifting book. So that was kind of an important focus for us. And that book is, is very uplifting. The other really neat thing about it is it's available in picture book, YA and adult formats. So that really added to um, you know, the reasons why we, that book kept rising up to the top. And um, we knew also that um, somebody, our library director had had him at her uh, previous uh, library system. And so she was able to tell us, you know, how well he did, how he was just as comfortable with students as he was with adults and, and you know, that he was just 
you know, the right person for this particular year. And so all of those factors helped in the selection and, and uh, it was close. We had some other ones that were close, but that was the one that we eventually selected. That was cool. Did, did he enjoy doing the escape room on his own book? <laughs> yeah, he, you know, uh, it, it was all very daunting to him, but because he was somebody who built his first windmill at 14 without uh, reading English, just using a book and going through, um, you know, junkyards to find parts of things that he might be able to use, not having tools. I knew that he was somebody who enjoyed solving a puzzle in general, you know, so I figured he would really get a kick out of it. And he did. He did. Um. So, so the life after Downton Abbey, the Downton Abbey support group, um, sounds like some, something I could have used. And and you said, um, so it sounds like it expanded beyond the original attempt. Did did you did um, did the folks get interested in checking out other books? Did they follow other avenues once they found the research material? Yes. Yeah, so originally, like I said, they had kind of approached uh, the reference librarian and had said, "Can we just use a meeting room to get together and talk about Downton Abbey?" Well. Our meeting room doesn't really allow for people to just have like a little social event. It's more of a, you know, a nonprofit group or educational setting. We were like, well, but she saw that potential there um, with these ladies um, of how we could engage them in what the library could do to help enhance their knowledge about Downton Abbey. And once they found out, you know, that we had all these other great tools and uh, resources at their disposal. Yes, they started using the online catalog. They started requesting things and using databases. And so um, it was really a great kind of progression, you know, where it's kind of an example of the, the reference uh, question, you know, people don't always know what it is that they're asking for. They're, they think they're asking for one thing, but we thought, no, maybe they could use a little more. And so it's kind of grown from there. And um, yeah, I think they really enjoyed it. Oh, that's so great. Um, we don't, I don't see any questions in chat. Um, we could just give it a couple more minutes in case someone has thought of one um, just now. Um, but I, I go ahead and share um, Katrina's and my contact information in case people do think of questions later um, or they want more information or they've got suggestions and ideas of their own. Um, and I'll put our contact information in the chat too. Um, and I also um, would just like to thank Ellen for coming and sharing so, I mean, so many ideas that are great and you've, you've had them implemented for a while and you know they work. So it's really awesome to see that the community comes together for such a wide variety of of programming, um, all different topics. It's great. Um, and I will mention um, and put it in the chat, we've got a post-webinar survey. Um, we'd love to hear some feedback about our webinar, what things worked, didn't work, what you took away from it. There's also a suggestions portion on there. If there's certain webinar topics you'd like to hear or different programming ideas you'd like to hear, please share with us. Uh, this is how we kind of build on our webinars and our trainings and, and get feedback um, for IMLS um, to get our, to do our reports. Um, so we'd love to hear from you, um, but I don't see any, any questions in chat. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, it was great. And we again, thank Ellen for her time. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Bye everybody. Thank you, Ellen. Bye. Bye everybody.